Is it possible to have mind over matter? Baby, the brain is king. The body is the kingdom. Yes. How long will that take to happen? Long enough for it to be the mainstay of your personality. To our very brain, those great thunderstorms, we have tapped yet let a third of its ability. If we lived entirely the wholeness of our brain, which would require the wholeness of our DNA to be activated, we would become the legends of old, the immortals. I really believe that the body wants to heal itself and the limits are in our own minds of what we believe is possible. Um, I think so much more is possible than we appreciate. Everyone's DNA, they use less than a third of the DNA. Did you know that there are immortal genes? Did you know that you have immortal DNAs? Did you know that you have the DNA to grow any part of your body, to change it any way you want to? Did you know you have the DNA of humanity? Did you know that you can turn a predisposition of genetics of blindness into a predisposition of sight? Did you know that you can tap your DNA to not only make you immortal, but reverse your aging? Do your genes have that? Yes, they do. It's what Janine gene fingerprinting is all about in its infantile stages. But it's embarrassing when we really know it. Because the great question is, well, if I have an immortal gene, how come I'm not immortal? Why in the is it still there? You can edit that out. Or you can leave it in according to the maturity of the audience. But I'm certain I have said nothing new under the sun, Horatio. You know why? Because you focus only on your emotional means to an end. So your DNA holds what is replicant in you to an experience. You have never gone outside of yourself to create the experience of yourself. I've been lucky enough to be independent the whole way through, which has made me, I guess, very direct, which some people mistake as arrogant. I don't think my approach on business is what the average person would advise. Like most, I hear people say, never put up your own money. And I'm saying, put your own money up. Work harder than everyone, be patient. And just know that if you're gonna do something on your own, you're gonna have to feel some pain. So like a vampire life, you know, we've had a certain amount of success in a, in a very short period of time. And I'm like the little Jewish guy behind it. You know what I mean? Like before, there's always a, a, someone from another culture that's behind it, funding. And in Harlem, your whole thing is not to get hit by work. You want to be the connect. You want to put your own dough up. You want to buy your work. And if you fuck it up, you fuck it up. But when you get that, you can pay it and do what you need to do. If you can name someone in the urban business or an urban brand that's owned by an urban person, not to say a person's being paid a percentage or sweat equity because they're the ambassador or the face of the brand, but are they doing the P&L? Are they doing the production? Are they doing the sales? Are they making sure the bills are paid? Are they paying the staff even if the... Uh, sales didn't ship. The difference with me is I can do all of these things because I'm the one that puts up the money. If I feel like making a motor oil, I can make a motor oil. Or if I want to make a liquor, I can make a liquor. Just because I'm a cut out the connect, I know how to get it developed, I know how to get it manufactured, I know how to produce it, I know how to have it distributed, I know what sales, you know, I know the game. When my children, you know, look and, and ask ab about what I do, they know I'm the boss. They know I put up my own dough. They could care less what they read in the paper. They see it every day and their quality of living is never compromised. They, they know that there's no other man that can walk in the room that's going to make me bow down or talk with a different tone or be extra nice to. And that's what I watch all of these so-called men do. You know, they claim they're bosses and they have these things, but someone else is paying for it. And when that someone else from another cult, culture walk, walks in a room, you know, I see voices change and demeanors change. And 
it's just disgusting. I don't even want to bring up names because I don't want to. I wouldn't even want to do that to people that other people look up to, <laughs> that they think are strong. You know, and you see how weak they are when some little white man walks in a room that can cut them a check. It's disgusting. Have you ever watched a James Bond movie where it doesn't look like he's losing at some point and then he wins? Or Batman? Or Iron Man? Or any superhero? There has to be some diversity for you to, you know, overcome to win. You know, you can't be a champ unless you, uh, you know, are in a place where you look like you're going to lose and then you win. The pain that's going to come with being independent, you have to embrace it because it's going to happen. And also know that the more successful you get, the more problems you're going to have. The more knots you're going to have to untie. Being a boss does not mean smooth sailing. It means having the ability to care about other people before yourself and to untie problems, untie knots. That's all it is. There's, it's not business if there's not problems. There's nothing good without struggle. It just doesn't happen. In all my experiences, there hasn't been one thing that's been successful without me feeling some pain before it was successful. So now when there is pain, I embrace it. You know, I've been embracing it. I'm a G about it because I know that must mean that if I'm cool, that you know, what awaits me. It's the darkest before the dawn. I don't, I don't want to like sound corny, but that's really what, that's, that's what has to happen. What I learned in my experience in the corporate world and with Rockefeller was, if I want to be truly happy, I got to put up the money. Because whoever puts up the money is the boss. And that's that. It doesn't matter if someone gave someone a lot of money to watch. That's not a boss. That's a supervisor. And that supervisor usually thinks he's a boss and projects as a boss and will piss someone else off. That's putting up the money. So a lot of my frustration would come from the fact that everyone that was speaking, none of them put up the dough. And we put up our own money. We were partners. We had a 50-50 venture. So in that environment, it would frustrate me. It'd be like being at a dice game and someone else speaking on your money. Because usually in corporate, no one's putting up the money. It's public and there's a board and you know, there's a bunch. No one, one person that's making decisions is using their own dough. I can't talk to people or be nice to people that I don't respect that aren't putting up the money. After selling my interest in uh, rockware so that I could put the money into what I wanted to put it into which was Rachel Roy and other fashion things and magazines and all that stuff my life became a lot easier because I never had to argue with anybody again because I was the boss and I still am a boss doesn't get told what to do a boss, a boss might get advice from an OG advice but you're not being told what to do my dream is to be completely independent be able to direct be able to um, design and make clothes as I want and to be able to cook for my children and cook well. You know, I'm the kind of person that considers himself a wild animal because I eat the food I kill. That's how I eat. No one's giving me nothing. I'm not eating that day unless I kill that. So when I'm around other people that I consider tame because they have the security of a job and they have a leash, I'm looking at them like they're tame. I'm a wild animal and you're not. Who's gonna be the cooler person in the room? The American dream doesn't exist. There never was an American dream. We all grew up with the American dream. The American dream are, you, are surprisingly, very interestingly, the things we spend the most amount of money and time on. What are components of the American dream? Owning a home, going to college, having a safe and stable job for 40 years, and then a nice retirement income. All three of those things have been destroyed in the American dream. We already saw in 2009 that the American dream was a total lie in the mortgage industry. A lot of people say, well, I need roots. I need my kids to grow up with a backyard. Factory owners were the initial lenders or the initial people who would sell you your house because they don't want you to move away from the factory. They want you trapped at your job. You know, you picture the white picket fence. The white picket fence is not to keep other people out, it's to keep you in. College, we already know student loan debt has passed $1.1 trillion. And meanwhile, incomes for people ages 18 to 35 have gone straight down. The third part of the American dream, the uh, solid, stable, income. In general, the average person stays at their job now about four to five years, not 40 years. That doesn't happen anymore except for our grandparents and parents. Corporate America is very quietly laying everybody off and hiring them back instantly through a temp agency. Why do they do this? So they can pay less money, so they don't have to worry about benefits, so they can fire you more easily without giving you the classic three warnings. We're moving into this freelancer economy. America is made up of 320 million people, all of diverse backgrounds. We all have to decide for ourselves what our individual dream is. Don't subscribe to some um, mass hypnosis dream that was designed to get us to spend as much money on t and time on other people's dreams as possible. Choose your own dream and follow that first.
Everybody thinks Warren Buffett is like their grandfather. He's kind of like older and cuddly, and then he gives advice every year with his letters and to shareholders. But the reality is, Warren Buffett will slit your throat in a dark alley. Like, he is not on the side of the average investor. He has never been on the side of the average investor, and he never will be. I wrote a book, Trade Like Warren Buffett. I went back to not only his Berkshire Hathaway letters, which are all publicly available, but to his very private letters from his hedge fund days in the 1950s, long before anybody even knew who Warren Buffett was. And I can tell you, he is after your blood. The one thing Warren Buffett has said, which I think investors need to really remember, is that when you buy stock, you're not buying like a poker chip, which you're gonna make or lose on the next hand. If you believe the story of a company, it takes a long time to develop. And I'll give Warren Buffett credit for expressing that in a very concise manner. But, 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 Warren Buff says his favorite holding period is forever. That is a fucking lie. You can bleep that out. <laughs> But that is a fucking lie. Warren Buffett wants you, the average investor, to hold forever because you have one big advantage over Warren Buffett that he can never ever compete with you on. He's buying and selling every day, but he just can't do it as fast as the average investor. It's not like he's gonna buy 100 million shares of IBM tomorrow and sell 100 million shares of IBM the day after. He wants you to hold IBM forever so he can buy and sell without you doing anything. Even with a guy who seems as kind and gentle as Warren Buffett, always look for the good reason and the real reason. If you have a teenager, you know exactly what I mean. There's always a good reason. I wanna study at the library, and there's a real reason. All my friends have drugs at the library. So that's the exact same thing with Warren Buffett. When you buy a house, let's say you're gonna put down an enormous down payment, you're gonna have closing costs, you're gonna have maintenance, you're gonna have mortgage, you're gonna have property taxes. Forget about the tax deduction on the mortgage, it's not that big. Ultimately, you never really own your house. The government owns it, that's why you're paying property taxes, and the bank owns it, which is why you're paying a mortgage. You might argue, well, rent is just flushing the money down the toilet, but property taxes and maintenance are not predictable. I had a hurricane hit my house. The landlord has to take care of everything. The rent did not cover his maintenance. I feel bad, but I'm renting, he chose to own. If you really believe housing's a good investment, buy a real estate investment trust on the stock market and watch it go up or down, and your money's totally liquid, which is an important quality of every good investment. When you're just paying rent, you've saved all of that cash you would have put into, into an investment you're never going to see again, and or you're gonna see years and years later. Cash is king. In this uncertain economy, invest that cash in yourself, and that is the best return you can possibly have. So I wanna start by asking you a pretty serious question. I don't want you to answer it out loud, but I want you to answer it honestly to yourself. And the question is really simple. Are you a genius? It's a little uncomfortable. If you do a search on Google for is a genius, all these pictures show up. The thing is, Albert Einstein sort of ruined the whole genius thing for people because we got this feeling that in order to be a genius, you have to revolutionize quantum mechanics or something that we don't even understand. And I'm here to talk about a fundamental shift in the world that we live. It used to be that one guy had the leverage to really make a difference in an organization in the world. But what occurred is we switched to a world of factory farming. We switched to a world of factory factories. We switched to a world where business was about building systems that made money. The most important person of the 20th century, when they look back 500 years from now, is this guy. You may not recognize him, it's Henry Ford. What Henry Ford did that was so important is he figured out how to build a system that enabled him to take a 50 cent a day man and give him enough leverage and enough productivity that he could afford to pay that guy $5. The system was the king. The system was all about getting stuff done fast and productive. And we invented school. Universal schooling is only 150 years old. We built this system to teach people to fit in. And the reason is because if you fit in, if you fit in, you become a compliant cog in a giant machine. And the reason I came here is because now, there's a new class of person, 
an artist. And when I say artist, I don't mean artist the way you might think of artist. When I say artist, I mean somebody who does human work, unpredictable work, makes a connection with someone else and changes them for the better. That what art is, is the opposite of being a compliant company. That what Picasso did for a living was he did not become a replacement for the camera. We had cameras. We didn't need someone to become a, a system who would just paint things as they were. He painted things as he saw them. What art became is the work of a human being who's doing something that someone else couldn't do. Artists aren't necessarily people who can draw. Now, the thing is that if art, if painting is your job, it's not art, it's paint by numbers. And that's an interesting item, but it's not one that we value very highly because anybody could do it. So if I had to boil it down to just a few words, it's this simple. If I can write down what you need to do, if I can give you the map, then I can find someone to do it cheaper. And I will. So we look at this and we get really nervous. And what the market's going to say to you is, you know what? You can try to charge extra, but if all hugs are the same, I'll take these hugs. Thank you very much. Part of the challenge here is this. Let me get a little economic geeky on you here. A talented pin maker could make eight pins a day. And so you paid them a fair amount because it wasn't easy to make pins. After the pin making machine was made, four untalented people with 10 minutes of training could make 10,000 pins a day. And Karl Marx looked at this and said, two teams, owners, workers, something just changed. Here's the thing. So let's say you want to make a video or write a book or start a radio station or sell handmade crafts. Here's the bad, scary thing. No one can say no to you anymore. You don't have to say, I got rejected by that publisher. The FCC won't give me a license. I can't get to the crafts fair. No one on NBC will put my show online. Just do it. You can go. There's no one to blame it on anymore. So I think there's a hierarchy here. And it's a hierarchy you might be familiar with. The lowest thing you can do to get paid for is lifting. And there's growing stuff, producing stuff, selling stuff, which is really hard because people are afraid to do it connecting other people, because that takes the work of the heart, and finally creating and inventing stuff, which no one ever taught us how to do. The problem is that if you spend your time following instructions, you have to work 14 hours a day for not much money. You're not looking for a path. If there's a path, then everyone's on it. You're looking for choices. The more choices there are, the more chances you have to do something interesting and remarkable. So I'm not here to say you must be an entrepreneur. They are what I'm calling linchpins. People we can't live without. People who take real risks. Not financial risks, but emotional risks. They're artists. I'm going to argue Warren Buffett isn't an artist. Warren Buffett doesn't have to tell us all the stuff he tells us. He could just be this anonymous billionaire, but he's not. He's teaching us stuff. That what artists do, in addition to changing people, is they give gifts. Art is based on the idea that there's an exchange of gifts, not a financial exchange. And here's the reason. When I sell you something, we're done. It's over. We're now farther apart. What art needs to do is bring us closer together. Right? Art is this connection that comes from one person making a gift to another. That doesn't mean that people who do art get nothing. But in the short run, you must be willing to give something extra. So if you, it's the art of doing it when you're not required, that when an artist realizes they have abundance, that they're not going to run out of ideas, that they're not going to run out of smiles, and they realize, wait, I better give some of this stuff away or it's going to spoil. That this idea of abundance instead of scarcity flies in the face of owning a factory. Factories are all about scarcity. Why would anyone buy something if they didn't need it? But what people who make art realize, the more they touch people, the more they change people, the better they do. So this idea of day's work for day's pay is bogus. That what we need to do instead is figure out how to have this posture of change and posture of generosity. So why is this so hard? Because 80% of you think I'm completely full of it. It's hard because people might laugh at us. And that's what we want. We want someone to tell us what to do. We want to be more average than average. The lizard brain says, whoa, 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 whoa. You're talking about things that could get me in real trouble. So let me tell you seven different ways that linchpins do what they do. And they're very different. One, they create a unique interface between the customer and the organization. If you've got someone in your organization who's the one, number two, is you bring a special kind of creativity to situations that your coworkers can't figure out how to do. That's a skill. You can learn it. You're not born with it. 
The third one is you know how to manage product projects of great complexity. Right? Think about that person in your office. Doesn't matter how many inputs there are, they can get that movie produced, they can get that conference, hold off. Those people are really hard to find and important to hold on to. The next one is leading customers. Figuring out how to establish a tribe and take them somewhere. The next one is inspiring staff. That person at any level in the organization, almost never the CEO, who the rest of the staff will follow to do almost anything. It's hard to live without that person too. And the sixth one is deep domain knowledge. The geek, the uber geek, the person who knows everything about black ink and the 12 different kinds of Pantone cells and the different specific weights and measures of the whole thing. And the seventh one is the one you came in thinking was the only one. And that's being really good at the thing. Anyone recognize this guy? This is the most famous in Australia. Talented, over-the-top sportsman who ever lived. His name was Donald Bradman. He was three times better at cricket than Michael Jordan was at basketball. He was four times better at cricket than Tiger Woods was at golf. This guy was the greatest cricket player who ever lived. Here's the newsflash. You are not Donald Bradman. You will never be, you will never be the Donald Bradman of anything. So stop letting the lizard brain tell you you're not good enough. Yeah, none of us are as good as Donald Bradman. That's okay, because what we're really looking for is passion, right? That what, what really matters is being willing to stand up and make it happen, to ship. This idea of shipping of getting it out the door is so much more powerful than it used to be. Because it used to be that there were all these people who could say, no, it's not ready. And all these people used to say, no, we have to wait. But now it's so easy to get to market that shipping is in. So here's the question. I want you to think hard before you answer it. And I don't want you to say anything, I just want you to do something. If the answer to this question is yes, stand up. So the thing I would say is when you grow up you tend to get told that the world is the way it is and your, your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money, um, but life, th that's a very limited life life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you and you can change it you can influence it you can you can build your own things that other people can use and the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will you know if you push in something will pop out the other side that you can you can change it you can mold it um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this, uh, th this uh, erroneous notion that life is, is there and you're just going to live in it, versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. Um, I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better, because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn Having that, gone you'll through never be divorce the same again. at 36 without children, I had to really stand strong in my faith to believe that the desires God placed in my heart for a happy, healthy marriage and family were still possible. And I had my days <laughs> where I didn't necessarily feel it, but I chose to believe it. And a few years ago, um, I connected with my now husband. The first time we were having lunch, he kept talking about his daughters. He had told me he had to leave at a certain time because he had to pick them up from school. And being a woman who always wanted kids, I had written down names of, you know, that I would give my children. And so if I had a girl, I had a couple of names that I loved. One was Sophia Grace and another was, at, uh, was Olivia. And so he kept talking about his daughters. I said, well, what are their names? And he said, oh, the oldest one, I named her. Her name is Sophia Grace. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> then he said, my younger one, her name 
is Addison Olivia. And I was just blown away. And over and over again, God just kept confirming that we were indeed met for each other. And we got married, and then we now have a son uh, who is almost two years old. Uh, actually, two years old uh, this month in February. And I just look at what God has done. I've gone from being single, divorced, having to have hope and a lot of faith. Um, but finding my happiness as a single person, I believe, propelled me to be in that right place, in that right frame of mind for the man that God intended for me. Everyone pretty much knows about creative imagination or visualization. Mm -hmm. You know, it's pretty, many people have, um, you know, cut their teeth on that kind of practice. You know, you see what you want, you, you, you feel that you have it, you bring it into manifestation. There's nothing wrong with visualization at all. It's a wonderful evolutionary stage in a, an individual that's walking the spiritual path. The only thing about visualization is that it has a level of limitation because you can only visualize what you know already. You can take a picture out of a magazine and do a vision board. You can look at somebody else's life and visualize that for yourself, you know. So it's within a certain paradigm. Visioning is catching an idea outside of your present paradigm so that you're making yourself receptive uh, to the spiritual idea that the universe wants to birth through you that you may not know about. In other words, you may be enculturated by your society, by your religion. In the Western world, we have all these models of success. You're successful if you have a house, two kids, a picket fence, two cars. You know, people get that and they're not happy. But someone could visualize that and, and manifest it and realize, oh my God, I'm still unhappy. Visioning is different. Visioning begins with the spiritual idea that there is planted within each and every one of us a powerful destiny, a powerful, unique way that the universe wants to express itself. So instead of telling the universe what we want, we instead ask a question. How does, what does, you know, what, what is the universe's idea of my life? And we begin to catch that idea. You know, what, what is my growing edge? What must I become to manifest that vision? What do I already have in my house that I can use to serve the vision? What must I let go of? What does willingness look like? We ask a different kind of question because here's a hierarchy of questions. Behind every problem, there's a question trying to ask itself. Universe being progressive. Behind every question, there's an answer trying to reveal itself. Behind every answer, there's an action trying to take place. And behind every action, there's a way of life trying to be born. So a problem, the word problem comes from emblem. It's emblematic of the content of consciousness that's being projected onto the screen of life. Because the universe is progressive, the universe wants you to ask a question. So if you have a problem, you have to ask a question. What is the nature of reality? What is the nature of prosperity? What is the nature of love? The universe will start to answer that. After it answers that, it will start to give you an action to take. And then it will birth itself into a way of living. So visioning begins with the question. You can say, what is God's idea of itself as my life? So another analogies are poor sometimes to use, but if an acorn were to go into the visioning process, it would say, you know, what is God's idea of itself as my life? It would begin to see an oak tree, an oak tree that had never existed before, an oak tree that is so unique that there would be no other oak tree like it. And it would, it would say, well, what do I need? What do I need to become for this oak tree to manifest? Well, you're going to have to die to your littleness. You know, the, the, the acorn's going to have to crack open. It's going to have to be planted in the right condition. It's going to have to let go of its smallness. It's going to have to embrace the infinite field of divine possibility within its soul. Eventually, the condition is right. It becomes an, an oak tree. There are things within us that we have no idea that are even there because we've been indoctrinated by the society in which we are living. A high-tech, low-touch society. Consumerism, materialism, 
fear, doubt, worry. And so we visualize what we think we want to be happy. Nothing wrong with that. But beyond that, there's a gift, a talent, a capacity within us all that's trying to emerge. Robert Browning indicated, you know, there's an inner splendor, you know, that's trying to escape. So the visioning process invites the inner splendor to come up that may shock our surface mind. It may, it may surprise us as to what's trying to emerge and what we must become. And now, outside of our present paradigm, there, the miraculous is there. It's something trying to happen through us and we keep growing and growing. So visualization is a stage of our spiritual growth. It teaches us there's a law in the universe, teaches us the friendliness of the universe. It teaches us that our thoughts transmute themselves into things. It, it, it teaches us that things don't just happen, they happen just. It's a good teaching stage. But then once we become comfortable and realize that the universe is friendly, we can begin to give up control and ask a higher question. And now we lose control, we move into surrender. <sighs> that's, that's, that's the big game. Another study has come out. I'm sure they spent a lot of money on this with great insight that says people don't save enough to retire on. Wow! Oh, you're kidding! Really? I thought everyone had millions of dollars in their 401k. You mean people don't save money? You're kidding me. I mean, most people walk around, I'm going to buy this and put it on payments. I'm going to buy that and put it on payments. I'm not saving anything in my 401k. I can't spell Roth IRA. They spend everything they make <clears throat> with this great idea that they're going to retire and count on the government, which is well known for its ability to handle money to take care of them. Dude, what's going to end up happening is you're going to be so broke, you can't pay attention. I mean, minimum wage will be giving you a raise. I mean, you're going to be so bad, you're going to be ordering the cookbook 72 ways to prepare Alpo and love it. You know, it's a funny joke in a way, but in a way it's not. I literally had a friend of mine not long ago who went to visit his aunt. He hadn't seen her in a while, and she was in her 70s. She wasn't in really good health, and the, the home was a paid-for home, but it was a modest home, and it was really clean and nice and had been kept up well. And um, he went to make lunch, and he opened up the cabinet, and it was full of dog food. And she didn't have a dog. That scares the crap out of me. Because I, I do not want to be working at McDonald's when I'm 78. Unless it's the one I own in St. Thomas. I, I just don't want to live like that. And you know, there's only one way that you don't retire broke. You have to save money. That's why I get the big money right there. Insi insights like that. You know, it really doesn't matter the quality of your investment or how smart you are or how sophisticated you are if you don't put any freaking money in the account. So USA Today has got this story out. 36%, this study says, uh, front page of the money section USA Today, about 36% of workers have less than $1,000. Been there, done that. When it comes to retirement savings, 36%, a little over one-third of Americans have less than $1,000 in savings. That's financial suicide. It's not going to go well for you at retirement. Here's what's really scary. Only 22% have more than $100,000. Now, I got to tell you, if you stack 100000 bucks on the corner of this table, I'll smile and take it, okay? That's a lot of money. But when you get to retirement, it's not. Because if you're living on 8%, that's $8,000 a year. Living on 10%, that's $10,000 a year. It's 800 bucks a month. We're back to dog food again, people. And that's $100,000 saved, and that's only, 100000 and above is only 22% of Americans. Well, you can't save money out there. Yeah, you can't save money because you freaking spend it all. That's why you can't save money. You can't save money because you don't have a plan. You can't save money because you don't care. You're more worried about the big screen. I've got to have an 80-inch because my 70-inch is just not cutting it. And so I have nothing in my retirement. Zip! Zero! 
The survey findings said that debt is weighing heavily on many people. Oh, <laughs> see more this surveys, man. It's, I'm glad they got this thing because none of us knew that. Debt is weighing heavily on many people with 58% of workers and 44% of retirees saying they have a problem with their level of debt. Yeah. Like workers, many retirees are also short on funds with 58% having less than $25,000 in savings and investments. About 60% of the people have less than $25,000. 65% of workers plan to, to work at retirement. I'll bet. Here's what's interesting. 65% of workers plan to work at retirement. And yet, like 75% have almost nothing saved. So the other 10% are... Oh, they just don't have a clue at all. That's what that means. So many people realize they're not on track in saving for retirement, and the two most important reasons they give for not saving is the cost of living and day-to-day expenses. You know what? Cost of living is not your problem, and your day-to-day expenses aren't your problem. It's your spending. You have a car you can't afford. You're going on vacations you can't afford. You're buying clothes you can't afford. You had Christmas that rich people didn't have. You're spending like you're in freaking Congress. That's why you have no money. Now, if you're on a budget and you're getting out of debt, I'm not talking to you. But, I mean, when you say 36% of Americans, one-third of Americans have literally no clue how they're going to eat when they're not able to work because old age sneaks up on them, does that not scare you out of your mind, societally speaking. Well, we ought to take care of the poor. Yeah, we ought to take care of the poor. Here's an idea, though. If you're poor, maybe you ought to save some money so you're not anymore. Well, it's, it's easier said than done. Yeah, I know. It's what I've been teaching people for 25 years on this radio show. Get on a written plan. Live on less than you make. Set aside an emergency fund. Cut up your stupid credit cards. You know, here's what's hilarious. The 36th percent of Americans that have less than $1,000 in the bank, if you sat down and had lunch with them, I'll bet you they say, I'm using my credit card so I can get points to travel. My airline miles are important to me. They've got a better plan to beat the credit card company than they do to save for their own retirement because they bought the lie that debt is a way of life. See, when you don't have any payments, when you get rid of the car payment, when you get rid of the student loan that's been around so long you think it's a pet, you get rid of American distress, you get rid of I discovered bondage, You get rid of all this crap where you're paying payments out all the time, and you look up, you'll have money. And here's the other thing. When you start living on a plan, you're going to realize you've been spending more than you make. You're spending money you don't have to buy things you don't need to impress people you don't really like. Stop it. Stop it. You've got to freaking get in control. This is called growing up, America. It's an indication of maturity when you save money. One definition of maturity, emotional, spiritual maturity, is the ability to delay pleasure. And we've got, apparently, a large segment of our culture that are a bunch of children walking around in adult bodies because they have no ability to delay pleasure whatsoever, and you're going to become a major problem for the rest of us. Oh, you already are. Maybe it's time you started getting on a budget and selling. Maybe you need to amputate your freaking Tahoe. It's time to get the credit cards out and chop them up. It's time to get on a written plan, America. This just scares the crud out of me from a society standpoint. 36% of Americans don't even have $1,000. You got some work to do, boys and girls. You need to have to learn how to spell 401k real soon. This is the Dave Ramsey Show. What is cool? What your preacher told you is true. What your mama told you is true. You know, just having a happy, positive attitude. Uh, this is why I'm asking you to meditate so you can... Oh, it's okay. It's all right. Oh, they go outside and say, oh, yeah, it's all right. They say, that's what they mean by cool. The meditator is cool. He's a guy who walks the other thing. What's going on? They're going crazy. Really? Well, let's fix it. That's the cool dude. You want to hang out with him. He's the meditator. And you want to be that. You want to be the cool dude who's um, just moving towards his goals in life without frustration or anxiety or being separate from his, his, his power. This is what meditation does. It brings you close to your power. 
We're all here to be happy. That's what we're here for. Meditation promotes happiness. The more you can see what's going on, you, you wake up one morning and you decide the world's really good and sweet and you're happy with, and you're moving around the world, you're optimistic and you, and you wake up another day and you're upset and frustrated and the world is bad and, you know, that creates a cycle of bad. And you wake up and you're still and it kind of reminds you that it's okay that it becomes a cycle of good. So any one of us who, you know, want the cycle of good to happen, want to be optimistic, want to be a, an inspiration, want to make everybody else's lives better so they can be better. If you're a man and you don't want to meditate because you're tough, you know, let the world be tough. If you're a man and you want to meditate uh, and you finally decide the world is okay, let the world be okay. That's, what, that's up to you. If you want a tough world, you want to figure out what it's like in prison and how to be mean all your life and have a mean life. You'll show it on your face. You'll show it in your physical. You'll be sick, be sad. It's up to you. The more toys you have, it doesn't make you happy. I got many rich friends who are very sad. Success is when you can be in touch with the happy thing inside you. Other than that, it's, it's not, there's no payment. There's no, there's no end to the amount of junk you can acquire. The amount of things that you could uh, invest in, the next business, the next, next girlfriend, the next, you know, it's always the next. You know, until you get in the box and you always, I can't wait till, I can't wait till, I can't wait till. The practice of being here. I can't wait to go to school. There's going to be all this stuff going on in school. Then you get there and it's like, I can't wait to get out of school. Then you, you know, people spend their lives like that. Meditation teaches you to appreciate now. And without that precious now, there's no, there's nothing in life. Focus. It's critical. You know, when, you, when you're distracted and you're moving around, as we all are most of the time, you miss all the, the, the things, that the elements of whatever you're working on. In other words, presence is the only thing that creates. You can't have an idea in the future or in the past. You can't be funny or laugh or be happy in the future or the past. So you need presence. You want to be able to walk throughout, you know, your day and see what's in front of you. Watch the miracles unfold or whatever. You got you to see it. So that's, that's the only time you're there, is when you're there. So meditation promotes stillness. When you're still is the only time you can think. And so when you have all these distractions and, 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 and you have all this noise in your head, you're not, you can't possibly do your job. You can't possibly be good. You can't learn. Learning comes when you have comprehension that from stillness. So meditation is the practice of, of touching that stillness. Now, I've actually always found something uh, to be very true, which is um, most people don't get those experiences because they never ask. Uh, I've never found anybody that didn't want to help me if I asked them for help. I always call them up. I called up, um, this will date me, but I called up Bill Hewlett when I was 12 years old, and he lived in Palo Alto. His number was still in the phone book. And he answered the phone himself. He said, yes? He said, hi, I'm Steve Jobs. I'm 12 years old. I, I'm a, a student in high school, and I want to build a frequency counter. And I was wondering if you had any spare parts I could have. And he laughed, and he, he gave me the spare parts to build this frequency counter, and he gave me a job that summer in Hewlett Packard, working on the assembly line, putting nuts and bolts together on frequency counters. He got me a job in the place that built them. And I was in heaven. And I've never found anyone who said no or hung up the phone when I called. I just asked. And when people ask me, I try to be as responsive, you know, to pay that, that debt of gratitude back. Um, most people never pick up the phone and call. Most people never ask. And that's what separates sometimes the people that do things from the people that just dream about them. You gotta, you gotta act, and you've gotta be uh, willing to uh, fail. You gotta be willing to crash and burn. You know, with people on the phone, with starting a company, with whatever. If you're afraid of failing, uh, you won't get very far. You know, you can have the greatest dreams in the world. You can have the most vivid, exciting vision. But if you don't believe you can do it, you'll never take the steps forward. You know, I wrote Why Not You from my heart um, to talk about authentic confidence and the power 
of having authentic confidence. I was literally journal journaling one day. I was um, kind of thinking about other people who were doing what I really wanted to do with my life. And I realized I was putting those people on a pedestal as though they had access to something I didn't have access to. And as I was praying about it, I just sensed in my spirit that God was saying to me, Valerie, why not you? Why can't you fulfill your dreams? Those people don't have anything you don't have. And that was a starting point for me of beginning to build the confidence and the self-efficacy to believe that I could do what it was that I dreamed I could do. And we think it's really simple. As a kid, we hear, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. But as adults, sometimes we don't really believe it. So I wrote Why Not You to help you build authentic confidence. It's a 28-day plan to help you eliminate confidence stealers, to help you eliminate those insecurities and really conquer your doubts and your hesitation so that you can understand that you can't fail at what God's created you to do. And you can be confident in that. So if any of these things connect with you, I really think this is the book for you. So if you ever shrink from opportunities out of fear that maybe you're not good enough or you don't have what it takes, um, if you put others on a pedestal, if you buy material possessions because you wanna prove your worth or display how successful you are, um, if you try to stack up credentials, you know, there's something I call achievement addiction. If you're constantly trying to achieve things because you're trying to pr prove yourself or you're trying to prepare yourself even more and you've already got everything that it takes but you keep thinking I need another degree I need more experience whatever the case might be if you don't stand up for yourself um, if somehow you've bought into the notion that you're better or others are better all of that has to do with a lack of confidence um, if you're constantly comparing yourself to everyone else I want to help you get free and I want to help you find that authentic confidence to really set a foundation for accomplishing the things that you're truly capable of. So why not you? 28 Days to Authentic Confidence. I'm looking forward to joining you on your journey to becoming more confident and believing in yourself in a bigger way. A lot of people ask, how do you organize your life when you have so much to do and so little time? It seems to be chaotic and the phone is ringing and people are calling and unexpected emergencies crop up and things that you expected to happen don't happen and things that, you, that do happen take much longer than you thought and cost much more and so on. Well, I say, join the human race. The fact is that, that in our world today, there's so much good stuff going on that we are eager to take a piece of everything. We're constantly raising our hand, if you like, and saying, I'll do that, and I'll do this, and I'll get into that, and I'll add that to my schedule, and so on. So as I mentioned earlier, the starting point of getting your life under control is to sit down and think about two things. Who you really are, which means what are your natural talents and abilities? What do you enjoy? What do you like doing? If you could wave a magic wand, if you're financially independent, what would you want to do with your life based on your own talents and abilities? Another question we ask is if you could work at any job or in any industry or in any position or in any part of the country, what would they be? And think, think, think them through. At Stanford University, they teach an exercise in the creative thinking uh, a part of the business faculty. It's called the uh, 2010 exercise. And that's imagine that you have $20 million cash in the bank, just for fun, an inheritance, you won a lottery, but simultaneously you have an incurable illness and you only have 10 years left to live. If you had $20 million in the bank and 10 years left to live, what choices and decisions would you make for your life? And that begins to clarify things. You start to become clear, well, if I had that money and only a limited time, there's certain things I would want to do and certain things that would not be that important. The second goal area is, what do you really, really want from your life? If you had no limitations, if you had all the money and all the time and all the talents and all the abilities, if you could do or be or have anything, what would you really want in your life? And write them down. And then what I encourage people to do is make a list of 10 things, 10 goals that you'd like to accomplish in the next year or so, and ask this question. If I could only accomplish one goal on this list, which one goal would have the greatest positive impact on my life? If you could only accomplish one goal in life, which one goal would have the greatest positive impact on your life? 
Now for most people, uh, especially when you're maturing in your career, when you're growing up, uh, the biggest goal is money. If you had money, then you could buy a house, home, car, family lifestyle, and so on. So that's quite normal. For other people, it may be a health goal. For business owners, it may be a business goal. For uh, uh, people with uh, relationship problems, it may be a relationship goal. But ask yourself, if you could achieve one goal or resolve one problem, and remember, a problem unsolved is merely a goal unachieved. Which one would it be? And write that down and make it that the major and definite purpose of your life. Make it the central organizing principle of your life. Now, Wolfgang von Goethe had a wonderful observation about life. He basically said that everything counts. Everything that we do helps or hurts. Everything adds up or takes away. So once you have a very clear goal, then you just have to ask yourself, based on what I really, really want for my life, what's most important to me, is what I'm about to do helping or hurting? Is it going to move me toward my goal or move me away? And if it doesn't move you toward what is most important to you, then it's a very good candidate to be delegated, outsourced, downsized, or even eliminated. In the process of re-engineering in business, the whole process of re-engineering is based on what is called process simplification. And the way that you simplify a process is you stop doing things. You eliminate low-value tasks to free up more time for the things that are most important to you. You keep going through your life and saying, what are the things that I could get rid of, that I could stop doing altogether, that I could delegate to someone else, or that I could combine and do all together? You keep thinking, how can I simplify my life? How can I re-engineer my life so that it's simpler and more streamlined? And then you concentrate more and more time doing fewer and fewer things, which give you greater and greater results, financial, and satisfaction emotional in your life. That's how you bring order out of chaos. Kick your own ass. Let me explain why. Salespeople are always saying to me, Jeffrey, how do I motivate myself? How do I, how do I stay positive, Jeffrey? Hey, aren't you on commission there, D'Artagnan? What are you thinking? Why are you asking me? You want to motivate yourself? Make more sales. But here's the secret. Your attitude impacts every single thing that you do. Put it simply, negative belief system leads to negative results and the opposite. The deeper you believe in yes, the more positive your results will be. Bad attitude, bad day, <laughs> that's your choice, baby. Your philosophy will drive your attitude. And if you have the right philosophy, you'll think in terms of yes and you'll develop a yes attitude. In order for you to be the best you can be for others, you have to start out being the best you can be for yourself. It sounds selfish, but you learn for yourself, you do for yourself, because selfish wins. If you want to be the best mom or the best dad, the best thing you can do is be the best person. 25 years ago, I was standing outside my hotel in Chicago waiting for a mentor, Mel Green. He was my client at the time and the CEO of a big company. It was February. 5.30 in the morning. The snow was coming down sideways. After I thought out in the car, Mel and I began to talk about his latest project, which as usual, turned from an idea into gold. I said, damn, you're lucky. Mel looked at me and winked. He said, hard work makes luck. That single expression has been my gateway to success and it can be yours. The secret that I found in the kick your own ass axiom is that most salespeople will not do the hard work that it takes to make selling easy because their mindset is wrong. They're not paying me enough. Come on, man. You know what to do. You're just not doing it. You have a responsibility to achieve for yourself. And the only way that this is going to happen is with self-inspiration, self-determination, and hard work that starts before everybody else gets up and after everybody else has gone to sleep. I make money while other people sleep. It's not about managing your time. It's about doing what's important now. See, working your ass off leads to selling your ass off. And selling your ass off leads to banking your own ass off.